In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It's a pleasure to be with you here on the 1st of July. It is Bobby Bonilla Day. And for those of you that are uh, familiar with uh, Major League Baseball and Bobby Bonilla, the New York Met, uh, I will talk about what Bobby Bonilla Day is all about. And uh, today's show, we're going to be talking about skepticism, uh, the uh, that philosophy and the different types of skepticism there are and the ways that we can understand and um to respond uh, to skepticism. But before we get into that, and before I explain what Bobby Bonilla Day is, I have a, a special guest here. Uh, Frank McKinney uh, is on the line with us. He uh, is currently uh, ha- having an open house of his uh, recent uh, micro mansion. Uh, Frank, thanks for joining us on the show today. Well, this is something I'm not skeptical about at all. I can, <laughs> I can join you anytime you invite me, Kurt. <laughs> what we're doing over here today is not just in the open house. This is something you want to be very optimistic about, right? You can, skepticism, there's no room for skepticism <laughs> when there's truth and truth abounds, right? That's so right. the truth is we're having a 9 a.m., 9 p.m. all day French toast to French fries to fireworks open house. So, yep, we started with French toast at 9 o'clock, had a bunch of guests come through. Nice. Now we just passed it to noon hour, actually, at 2 o'clock, French fries homemade french fries and then tell me we'll have a fireworks show wow that's awesome and this is your uh, your recent uh piece of artwork uh which looking from the pictures it's just a beautiful uh you know uh, building a beautiful home that you've got up for sale and uh, correct me if i'm mistaken it's just a couple blocks from uh the oceanfront is that right 345 feet from the beach yes this is my 42nd project in the last 25 years building all on or right near the ocean on speculation. So I build it without a buyer in mind, yeah. like the field of dreams. You build it and you hope they will come. Well, that's what we do. We furnish it down to the gold plate, toothbrush in the bathroom, linens on the beds and towels in the closets. And this is how we market them. This is how we sell them. As you said, I just finished this house. It is a micro mansion. And the definition of micro mansion is taking everything used to put in a 10 to 12,000 square foot house you know, big, big houses on the ocean right? and condensing it down into about 4,000 square feet. Yeah. And so while this is a smaller mansion, it still is uh, decked out to use the uh, colloquial term. <laughs> you know, there's an aquarium in the house, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's not just an aquarium. It's what we refer to as a living reef aquarium wall. <laughs> so it's an entire wall. The entire west, east wall of the house is is alive with fish and marine life. Yeah, right. thirty six <laughs> different living creatures in, awesome. in the uh, in the aquarium. Yeah, that is awesome, and I really mean that in the true sense of the word. Awesome, it inspires awe. Um, so that's that's really sweet what you've done there, and it's just it's a beautiful home, gorgeous home. Uh, for those uh, that are interested, um, we've. Um, Frank, this morning you did a quick uh, tour on your uh, your live stream, and we uh, we shared that on the Veracity Hill page. So those that want to check it out, we've got that. We're going to share the link on our website to the home as well. And uh, so it's just a really beautiful um, piece of art. Now, now tell me, Frank, who convinced you to wear those Fourth uh, of July themed uh, overalls today? <laughs> Hey, listen, over here in, in Ocean Ridge at the Micro Mansion, July 4th just started a little earlier <laughs> when I chose to wear the the patriotic overalls. So somebody buys the house today, the overalls go with the house. <laughs> on, on the spot if they sign the papers right now. <laughs> yeah, come on over. You know what? How about this? For you, Kurt, the the, the house is free. The overalls are three point four million. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Okay, now I got to ask. You know, my favorite drink um, is Dr Pepper. If you, you may remember from uh, from our discussion oh. when you were on, do, are you serving any DP there with the uh, French fries? You, how did you know that that's what's in my my cooler? Oh, good. You know what? And, and I think I think that one of the, the the cans, some of the cans out there, have a twenty fourth flavor in it. Kurt, mm. come on over. Mm. Taste wow. the 24th flavor. Wow. 
That's great, Frank. Right, the majority, unless you're unless you're an aficionado of Dr Pepper, we all know there's 23 flavors in there. But you've right? added, that, yeah, that a, you've added a special flavor. I've added a special flavor to this Micro Mansion version. Absolutely, boy, that must be a, a different tasting uh, Dr Pepper. Hopefully, I would like it if I had the chance to drink it. So, <laughs> <laughs> one of these days, one of these days, we should do Veracity Hill live from either my tree house or one of my houses. That'd hey. be fun. That would be sweet. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to make that happen. All right, now I gotta ask. So if if I get someone, if I get a referral for you for the house, what sort of donation can uh, Veracity Hill expect? <laughs> I will tell you exactly. We are paying a three percent selling commission. So if you take three percent, multiply it into three point four million, you get just over a hundred thousand dollars. Hot That'll diggity keep you on the air for a while. Wow. Well, listeners, if uh, you are interested in checking out Frank's house. We'll have the link for it. And if you want to purchase it, please help out Veracity Hill. <laughs> and we'll throw, we'll throw in the overalls. The overalls the as Pepper. well. And the, and the Dr. Pepper can with 24 flavors. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. Well, hey, I hope you have a good rest of your day and, and put on a great show tonight with those fireworks. Hey, hey guys, have, you have a great show on skepticism. I, I can't wait to listen to it because that's critical. We gotta, we gotta be, uh, we gotta be less skeptical and more believers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking about that. Cool, awesome. Thanks, Frank. God bless you. Good deal. All right, guys. Bye bye. Right, see you later. Bye. All right. So that is Frank McKinney. Uh, he is the real estate uh, artist, uh, and he really just designs some amazingly um, uh, gorgeous homes, beautiful homes. Uh, that are really they're decked out to the max and it's just what he does it's you don't even think you wonder where he gets these ideas you know an aquarium the wall i mean it's it, it's the aquarium it's it's just wild it's awesome uh well if you're uh, over there in florida and within driving distance i'd encourage you to go check out that house the open house he's doing today is uh, it's a lot of fun those events those open houses that he does okay uh so at the start of the show i had mentioned bobby bonilla some of you might, might be baseball fans. Uh, some of you uh, might not be baseball fans. So who is uh, Bobby Bonilla and why is July 1st Bobby Bonilla Day? Well, it just so happens that when the New York Mets signed Bobby Bonilla, who was, uh, if my memory serving me correctly, a third baseman um, at the time, um, that they signed him to a contract agreement uh, and pledged uh, to defer payment to Bobby Bonilla. So instead of paying them everything sort of all up front or within that year or even that for the length of that contract, they deferred payments from 2011 to 2035. So every year, Bobby Bonilla, who no longer plays for the New York Mets, will receive $1.2 million, (laughs) which is more than what many of the New York Mets currently make. (laughs) And Bobby Bonilla is just sitting at his home, bringing in $1.2 million every July 1st. Uh, so, <laughs> and let's see, from the article I've got here, um, Bonilla uh, also has deferred money that's being paid by the Mets and the Orioles, who took Bonilla for the final year and a half of his Mets contract back in the 90s. Uh, the five-year deal signed in 1991 for $29 million. <laughs> so, so he's just getting paid, doing nothing. He's actually really smart, uh, his... his um, his agent was probably pretty smart in this because at least for some athletes, they actually um, have a hard time um, with being good financial planners. So they just uh, spend lavishly with the money that they do have. So in this case, Bonilla is, you know, he's only given only uh, 1.2 mil a year um, on July 1st. So, you know, hopefully he's he's learned how to manage his finance as well. At any rate, so happy Bobby Bonilla Day, July 1st, every year until 2035. And, uh, the legend will live on. Okay, so <laughs> today we are talking about skepticism. And uh, if you have any questions about what we're going to be talking about, I'd love to hear from you. The number is 5052 Strive. That's 505 278 7483. And we've got the live stream going here on uh, Facebook so you can follow us along. If you're listening to the, uh, the podcast via download on iTunes or Google Play, I want to encourage you to go over to our Facebook page and like us. That way you can get some. Uh, notifications when we do the live stream. You can also follow us on Twitter. Just Veracity Hill is our uh, tag or our username. Um, And so also, uh, let me say this. If you are a longtime listener of the show, I would love to get a review on iTunes or Google Play of the podcast. Uh, So 
please give us five stars if you like what we're doing. If you're giving us constructive criticism, just give us a four. That's fine. <laughs> and, and leave us a comment. Uh, we'd love to get your reviews uh, of the show, of uh, you know the content that we bring to you week after week, the variety of topics uh, that we bring to you, uh, how it might be perhaps a bit challenging to your worldview to present a, a, a topic that you might not have considered before or a present topic that you formerly considered but hadn't given as much thought to anymore. Uh, we hope that uh, this is beneficial to you. Uh, so, okay, skepticism. Well, what is skepticism? There's a number of ways that we can uh, tackle this subject today. And um, skepticism is essentially um, more so than a position. It's a, um, it's, a philo- it's a posture, it's a philosophy, it's a way of thinking about something. And so the, the eternal skeptic is the one that always asks, well, how do you know? Well, how do you know that? You know, if I said, well, I walked my dog this morning, well, how do you know that? That's, that's the skeptic. Uh, of course, this could lead to serious, you know, I- issues on more important problems, like how do you know God exists, or uh, how, how can we know Jesus is God, those sorts of things. How do you know Jesus is raised from the dead? Well, the skeptic says, well, how do you know that? How can we really know those sorts of things? And so um, today I want to talk about three types of skeptics and categorize them into two camps. The first camp, uh, as I was talking to uh, David Montoya, who's uh, here with me uh, in the studio today on our our panel here. David, how you doing? Pleasure to be with you. Uh, We were were talking about um, the first type of skeptic, and this is what's called the iterative skeptic. So this is the, uh, you know, the the neighbor boy who says, well, why, 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 or really, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? The iterative skeptic is someone who reiterates uh, the skepticism that he or she has. And so um, I was watching a, um, a lecture on skepticism and epistemology by J.P. Moreland, who's a philosopher at Talbot School of Theology. And um, so he, he went so far as to say that the iterative skeptic is someone who does not participate. He's not a participant in the conversation. He's just taking pot shots at the participants. So when the people are speaking and trying to uh, come to uh, knowledge on some topic, the iterative skeptic is just from the peanut gallery. You know, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? Well, why is the person not a participant? Well, for starter, why is the iterative skeptic not a participant in the discussion? Because they're not seeking to find truth. They're just seeking to continually critique uh, the problems of the people proposing ideas. And so how can you know this? Well, if you ask the iterative skeptic, why should I believe what you're saying? Why should I take you seriously? Why should I take your objection or your concern, if it is a real concern, seriously? The answer to that is a source of knowledge. Well, because, and then the skeptic, the iterative skeptic says, provide some reasons. In this case, then, you can play the iterative skeptic in return. Well, how do you know that? And then he or she might say, well, yada, yada, yada. You say, well, how do you know that? And it just continues on and on and on, right? So you can all of a sudden begin to feel here, oh, right. Now let's have a real conversation. Let's have a serious conversation. And even if there are concerns, skeptical concerns, um, that would be from a more academic standpoint. And that's the second type of category that I want to talk about. Um, but let me hold off on getting into that in the meantime. I fir- first just want to talk about this um, iterative skepticism, that it's not very constructive. Uh, and it, uh, in many senses, I don't think it's serious either. I think the iterative skeptic is someone who hasn't given much thought to their own position and is merely posturing. Uh, I don't think they're really concerned about seeking truth. They're more concerned about trying to get someone to doubt what they believe. And sometimes doubting things are good. Uh, I think we should have uh, sort of an open hand on many beliefs that we have. But the iterative skeptic is the eternal skeptic, forever just questioning why, why, or how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? And it's not constructive. So I think for the most part, we should just ignore iterative skeptics um, until ultimately they'll become self-defeating if you want to ask them why they are 
um, why you should pay attention to them. Okay, so that's iterative skepticism. Um, but before we get into academic skepticism, um, I want to talk about some other issues and we're g- that'll lead us into a bit of academic uh, skepticism. Uh, by the way, I am uh, here following comments on the live stream. Thanks for those that are tuning in. Um, I see your comment there, Bob. Thanks so much for that. Um, okay, so one of the things got, that got me thinking about um, skepticism and why I should do the Worldview series, right? It's the first Saturday of the month on uh, this topic, was because I came across an article shared by a Facebook friend. Uh, it was on a political topic. It's from the Huffington Post. It's called, I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. And so the author um, basically uh, talks about uh, how the only way that we can care about people is if we support government programs. And so the, she, she writes, personally, I'm happy to pay an extra 4.3% for my fast food burger if it means the person making it, uh, making it for me can afford to feed their own family. If you're not willing to fork over an extra 17 cents for a Big Mac, you're a fundamentally different person than I am. She writes, I don't know how to explain to someone why they should care about other people. I'm perfectly content to pay taxes that go toward public schools, even though I'm childless and intend to stay that way, because all children deserve a quality-free education. If this seems unfair or unreasonable to you, we are never going to see eye to eye. Um, And she continues on to talk about different programs, political programs, government programs uh, that are beneficial for people, or uh, at least intended to be beneficial for people. And uh, this got me thinking, because... Uh, In classical rhetoric, and I clued this in to some of my um, Facebook followers about how uh, classical rhetoric uh, can help us uh, understand and to defeat skepticism, there are three um, themes, ethos, pathos, and logos. And um, not all rhetoric is bad rhetoric. In former years, I used to think that, oh, well, that's just rhetoric. That's just political rhetoric. Well, there's bad rhetoric, but there's also good rhetoric. Uh, so, So what is ethos? Well, ethos is... Uh, living essentially in one's habitat. Uh, you want to see that someone's like you. And uh, so, for example, a great example of this, Marco Rubio, when he was running for the president of the United States in the Republican primary, he gave a number of speeches. Multiple times he said the same thing over and over, that he's the son of immigrants who were uh, workers, uh, entry-level workers, um, you know, living, they were they were living out the American dream. And so when he tells that story, uh, or anytime anyone tells that story, right? They are trying to um, they're, they're trying to use ethos in their rhetoric. And it, don't get me wrong; it's not always a bad thing. It can be very much be a good thing. He's trying to get people to recognize that his life situation is like theirs. He's like one of them, and so that's the good use of ethos. Of course, I think there's the bad use of ethos when um, people try to um, convince you of uh, that they are just like you, but but the conclusion may not follow. You know, they might give you bad reasons. And we'll get to reasons in a minute. Pathos. Pathos is emotion, the use of emotion. And oftentimes on social media, uh, we use pathos a lot. Uh, we want, we can be emotive in saying, oh, well, here's this article and there's this great injustice. Here's this n- news article and how awful it is that that happened, right? And so that is uh, the use of pathos. And sometimes the emotion's good and sometimes it's bad. And a lot of this, the ethos and the pathos, you know, how do we know it's good or bad? Very much depends on the logos, the argument, the reason, the evidence. All right. So here in this Huffington Post article, the author uh, is uh, surely using some ethos for her audience. She's saying, I don't know how to explain to someone why they should care about other people. You know, she's, she's appealing to people that already think that way. Um, she also writes, like many Americans, I'm having political fatigue. So she's trying to sympathize with people, with their situation. Uh, so she's implementing the, uh, the ethos here. And the pathos, of course, is evident, right? Um, well, if, if you're not willing to pay for someone to have this free education or to have a so-called living wage, well, you just don't care about people. And people, you must hate people. Um, you know, that's the emotive, um, sort of argument, the emotive appeal, rather. But of course, the logos comes back and sometimes can bite people in the butt. um, Because the reality is, is that there are various ways to care for people. And uh, I provided in my discussion with my Facebook friend, I provided a number of examples of why this was the case. 
Sometimes government programs can be well-intentioned, but have poor outcomes or, or bad effects. And um, for example, the um, well, my position on the housing market crash, the government uh, in- provided incentives for banks to give out loans that they wouldn't have otherwise given out. Those of you that are familiar with the situation might remember those ninja loans, no income, no jobs, or assets. Loans that were given out despite the bank's uh, uh, you know, inability to bring that money back in. I think that was a motivating factor. What was the effect? Well, the housing market crashed, and a lot of people lost their homes or um, you know, they were foreclosed upon. And so that was a, a government program that had a good intention but a bad consequence. We could also think of other ones. Uh, those of you that might be more... Um, politically liberal-minded on issues. Here's one for you. The bank bailouts. The good intention of the government was we got to save the banks. The bad intention was, well, CEOs and high execs had a lot of bonuses that year. And uh, furthermore, now those banks are even bigger. And so that seems to go against, you know, what you might have liked. Um, Now, our proposed solutions to fix the problem might vary. But here's the point. The point is that the arguments don't always match up with the ethos and the pathos of the rhetoric. And so we've really got to understand and recognize all three aspects. And we we should think critically um, in in when we're evaluating arguments. Okay, so what does all this have to do with skepticism? Well, with skepticism, we're dealing with ethos, pathos, and logos. Logos. When we are approached by someone, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Is that an argument? Just think of it from the Logos standpoint. Is that even an argument? No, it's not really an argument. And we're going to get into that here shortly uh, regarding the sort of academic uh, skepticism. Uh, So I guess uh, let's just move into that now. So uh, with academic skepticism, there are two types of skeptics. Remember I said we're going to deal with three types of skeptics. we had the iterative skeptic. That's the one that you should just kind of ignore because they're not being constructive. And you can illustrate that through a dialogue with them, um, sort of a role play if you want. Um, and so in the academic skepticism, there are two types of skeptic. There are um, what we might call the nihilists. And these are people who think that you can't know anything. So if we're thinking about skepticism, think about how... Um, in terms of knowledge, we can't, go, uh, we can't know anything. So it's about depth, the depth of knowledge. We can't know anything. Now, are there really people that um, espouse this position? Well, funny enough, you say, yes, yes, there are. Uh, there are people that espouse this position. And so here we're going to play a, a couple clips for, uh, for you. Um, and just if you've got any questions, I'll be following along in the live stream while we play these clips here. Uh, this is... Um, from uh, the movie Expelled. Uh, It's uh, William Provine. And uh, listen to a little bit too about his experience. No gods, no life after death, no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no human free will are all deeply connected to an, an evolutionary perspective. You're here today and you're gone tomorrow. And that's all there is to it. Dr. Will Provine, professor of the history of biology at Cornell University. Oh, what's his last name? Ben. Uh, Will Provine. Well, Will Provine, but the narrator of Expelled. Who is it? Ben Stein. Ben Stein. That's the last name. Ben Stein. All right. So there he just gave the. Um, Bill Provine sort of gave that introduction there as to what sort of evolutionary naturalism brought about. Uh, this idea that well, you can't really know anything about any of these areas in life. <laughs> uh, and it um, was a fascinating experience for him. Provine goes and expands upon that, his college experience. Uh, for those of you who ha- haven't had a chance, I'd encourage you to go check out the movie Expelled. It's, oh gosh, probably maybe 10 years old already now. Um, interesting movie, though, about uh, the intelligent design movie and the censorship behind that. But, but how does that deal with skepticism? Well, you'll see there that for, for some... Uh, maybe we even say consistent evolutionary naturalist, we can't come to knowledge. We can't have any knowledge. And uh, that's, you know, I think problematic for some. Let me now play for you another clip here uh, from a debate between William Lane Craig and Alex Rosenberg. 
and uh, listen to the question uh, from the member of the audience to Rosenberg, and he's going to read out of his book here. Uh, and uh, just listen in. This is very fascinating. Dr. Rosenberg, I wonder if you might help me to understand how your view is not incoherent. Um, do you really claim in your book that sentences have no meaning or truth value? Uh, even the sentences in your own book? How is that not incoherent and self-refuting? Um, it, it, at least the sentences you've made tonight, surely you think, are true. Um, but if even you don't think that your position is true, why should we? Two paragraphs from the last page of the chapter of my book entitled The Brain Does Everything Without Thinking About Anything at All. Now, of course, this is at the end of a long chapter in which I've talked about neuroscience, uh, Nobel Prize winning research by Eric Kandel. Uh, the um, it's interesting here. I'm going to just stop it. So here he's explaining how this comes at the end of a chapter. And that should be a clue here that what he's about to tell you is a conclusion he's reaching from his position. So if um, metaphysical naturalism, even in this case, epistemological naturalism were true, where does that lead? And interestingly enough, both he and William Lane Craig agree on this, which is fascinating um, because usually debaters don't agree on uh, topics. But it was funny that they both agree on the entailments of Rosenberg's position here. A wonderful IBM computer Watson that beats us at Jeopardy, and about the best semantic and philosophical theories of intentionality. Pardon me for reading. Introspection is screaming that thought has to be about stuff, and philosophers and you are muttering, denying it as crazy, worse than self-contradictory. It's incoherent. According to you, Rosenberg, neither spoken sentences nor silent ones in thought express statements. They aren't about anything. That goes for every sentence in this book. It's not about anything. Why are we bothering to read it? It's not as if I haven't figured out that this is uh, an issue that is raised by science and, uh, uh, and in this chapter. And now I'll read you the last paragraph. Okay, so, so there he says he recognizes that this is an objection against his position. All right. So he, he, he clearly sees that, that it's a concern. So here's his answer. Look, if I am going to get scientism into your skull, I have to use the only tools we've got for moving information from one head to another. Noises, ink marks, pixels. Treat the illusions that go with them like the optical illusions of the previous chapter, a chapter in which I said, don't trust consciousness because it's mainly mistaken. Okay? This, this book is... Don't trust consciousness because it's mainly mistaken? It's almost like he doesn't see the irony here. <laughs> the fact that he shouldn't even trust his own thinking. And yet here he goes, continue to think and write and to convey messages to people. All right, let's finish up here. It's conveying statements. It's rearranging neural circuits, removing inaccurate disinformation and replacing it with accurate information. Treat it as correcting maps instead of erasing sentences. Now, there's a big business in philosophy about the nature of semantics and about the, uh, the, how intentionality is realized. And I ain't so stupid as to contradict myself in the puerile way that you're suggesting. Okay? What you got to do is read the book to figure out the answer. And send me an email and I'll send you a really long and hard paper called Eliminativism Without Tears, which I have written... All right, all right. So basically, it's, it's almost like he just doesn't see the irony. He says sentences don't have meaning, and yet there he's providing sentences because it's, it's merely a tool for somehow conveying ideas, which apparently don't exist. <laughs> it's quite astounding uh, that he thinks that we shouldn't even trust our consciousness um, because it's largely mistaken. So this reminds me of a quote from Charles Darwin. Darwin uh, wrote to William Graham on July 3rd, 1881. He wrote, But then with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. 
would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? You see, even for Darwin, if evolutionary biology, I should say evolutionary naturalism were true, so we're not talking about theistic evolution, if evolutionary naturalism were true, why would we trust our own beliefs? We wouldn't trust the beliefs of a monkey, right? Would we? Of course not. But we're just a little bit more evolved than they are. So that seems to pose a, a problem. And this is one of uh, Darwin's doubts uh, that he could even trust his own beliefs. And so here we're seeing this. We see this type of nihilism uh, with people that, well, we can't really know. Uh, we should be skeptical that we can know anything at all uh, here. Yeah, so I have a... Um... If yeah, David. I, may, I have a um, actual interaction here, and it says from the atheist: "What we do know beyond all reasonable doubt is that we are just evo- an evolved ape that got smart enough to be able to invent gods to explain the unexplainable." I, of course, bring up the quote that you just cited, and his response was to the monkey's brain epistemological nihilism comment was because our brains are all that we have to work with. Not a perfect tool, admittedly, but as there is no supernatural outside help, God, it is good enough for me, so we'll have to do. And, of course, my response is, that's an amazing admission. It's good enough for me, so we'll just have to do. Imagine if I argued God exists, it's good enough for me, so that we'll just have to do. I hope you can see why this is not a meaningful interaction yeah. with epistemological nihilism. Yeah, it just sounds like Rosenberg there, where Rosenberg said, oh, it's just a tool. It's, that's, that's really fascinating and uh, striking. Um, and um, Okay, well, we've got to take a break here, uh, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about how this is even, you know, how, how it is self-refuting and uh, the sort of infinite regress that it brings about and, and how to respond to, to it and other forms of skepticism. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Hello, I'm David Smith, the Executive Director of Illinois Family Institute, a state-based Christian pro-life and pro-family public policy organization. I want to invite you to join us as we seek to be salt and light to a dark and rapidly decaying culture. You can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can join our email list to get timely alerts and great cultural commentaries. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcasts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can attend one or more of the special events and forums we host in different parts of the state. We do all these things to encourage and equip Christians in Illinois. You see, we need you to help us fulfill our mission to boldly bring a biblical perspective to public policy. Our faith requires us to be bold, speak truthfully, and love our neighbors. Join us. Visit IllinoisFamily.org to learn more. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. All right, thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. Well, in the first half of the show here, we've uh, got an introduction to uh, skepticism, and we talked about uh, the two types of categories of skeptics, the iterative skeptic and the academic skeptic. And there's one specific type of iterative skeptic. He was just sort of the, you know, the neighborhood boy. Well, why, why, why? How do you know that? How do you know that? The eternal skeptic, uh, forever skeptical of anything that you ever say, and why we should not pay attention to that type of skepticism. Um, now, there are more robust forms of skepticism, uh, ones that we should take seriously. And so I want to continue talking about um, how we should um, respond to those. So the, the first type of um, 
academic skeptic would be someone who say is the nihilist, the one that says we can't really know anything at all about anything. Um, and so uh, there we played um, the clip from Alex Rosenberg, uh, who is an epistemological naturalist and uh, really a nihilist. That's where he thinks it leads. And um, I hope many of you were able to see how self-refuting this is, um, because obviously they're saying that they can know something and it's that we don't know anything at all. So they still are claiming to know something and they're still claiming to use uh, what they call as merely tools to convey meaning to us, to convey purpose, uh, to convey these ideas, uh, which they say don't exist. (laughs) Uh, And yet here they are using them. So it's... uh, it's self-defeating. And uh, so uh, basically um, h- how it's self-defeating is that it, de- it depends on them knowing something. So uh, J.P. Moreland uh, said in, that, in a lecture there uh, that I previously mentioned that you can't reasonably doubt anything until you know something. You can't reasonably doubt anything until you know something, all right? So what does that mean? Well, think about it. Even for Alex Rosenberg, he has to know some things, like how the brain works, okay? He has to know that he exists. He has to know something in order for the uh, the skepticism to take root. But then we're no longer dealing with nihilism anymore because we can know some things, all right? So in order to doubt something, he's got to know something to begin with. So that's sort of the, the depth approach. How do you critique the, the nihilist? Uh, David, before I move along to the, the next type of nihilist, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Or I shouldn't say the next type of nihilist, the next type of skeptic, I mean. No, not at all. Okay, cool. Good. All right, well, the next type and final type of skeptic is one that you might think of uh, who, who doesn't say that we can't know anything at all. But for, for all the things that we do know, maybe there's just one area that we can't know anything about. Okay, so think like scientism, for instance, says that science is the only arbiter of truth and that any sources of knowledge elsewhere, are, are, we can't have it. We can't have knowledge from any other source, any other field of inquiry, like history. So this is sort of your local skeptic, that whatever you might be talking about, say religion, for example. Well, we can't really know anything at all about religion. Uh, we can't have a basis for knowing that. It's just uh, it's just one's belief. Um, there are two types of arguments, and this is, by the way, the most serious type of skepticism. Uh, this is this is the the better of the the best of the three skeptics. All right. So the first type of argument is called the fact of error argument, and the fact of error argument goes something like this: uh, that if you have ever been wrong in your life, if you've ever been wrong in your life, how do you know you're not wrong right now? Okay? So, um, David, let me ask you. Have you ever been wrong? Oh, many times. Give me an example. I'll give you an example, actually, from the the apologetic world. Okay. Dan Barker usually, he uh, starts uh, for- out his presentations with Bible contradictions. Okay. And in a recent debate that he had... His d- debate opponent said, well, you once believed in God, and you now don't believe in God, therefore you are wrong, or you don't exist. <laughs> okay. So he kind of self-refuted himself. At yeah, that yeah, point. yeah. It, it, this is the fact of error playing out itself in a consistent yes. manner. Right, right. So, it, but in your life, though, let me play devil's advocate. Have you ever changed your mind on something? So you used to have a belief about something. You realized you were wrong about that and you changed your mind. Yes, I used to be a faithful, believing Mormon missionary. Okay. Working in the in Brazil at the age of 19 to 21. Yeah. Testifying about the quote-unquote restored gospel that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints presents. Yeah. And now I don't. Right. Okay. Well, so you were wrong once. Totally wrong. How do you know you're not wrong now? How do I know I'm not wrong now? <laughs> After careful, careful investigation, Dang. and I would say, of course, 
the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so good. Now, what the fact of error argument seeks to do, it seeks to discredit a category of knowledge that we might have. Uh, so let's say like religion, right? And if you can discredit one of those points, uh, then the, the category falls. The skeptic hopes that's the case. But here's the problem with that type of reasoning. Because it's wrong because it still depends on knowing something as true. All right? So you can only know that you were wrong if you are in fact, uh, if in fact you have knowledge of what is true now. Okay? You can only know you were wrong if in fact you are correct now. And if you are correct now, then you have knowledge, right? So uh, let's take a different example. Uh, Santa Claus. Well, so let's take an easier one. What would you have for breakfast? Nothing. Well, you didn't have... Okay, so how, how do you know that you had nothing for breakfast? Because hey, I'm hungry right now. Have you, ever been, <laughs> have you ever been wrong about what you've had for breakfast in the past? Have uh, you misremembered, misrecollected what you had for breakfast? Extremely rare. But it has, it has happened. So how do you, in fact, how do you know now that you haven't uh, misremembered, right? Yeah, because I have a consciousness, I have a memory that's quite reliable. Good, good. Especially okay. in, in the short term. Yes, yes. So um, ultimately this type of argument, the fact of error argument, fails because it depends upon known facts that we have. Chiefly that, David, you didn't have breakfast this morning. And you know that. And so uh, while you may have been mistaken in some other uh, instance. That doesn't mean that you are now. And that leads me to the next type of argument, which is called the mere possibility of error argument. And this basically goes, well, if it's possible that you could be wrong, how do you know you're not wrong now? All right, now let's see the difference here. The, the first one is the fact of error, the fact that you have been mistaken how do you know that you're not mistaken now? Versus, well, you could be wrong. So maybe you are, right? That's that type of argument. Now, before we get into the answer to this, let me move into the, um, the structured approach here on, on knowledge. So there are two main theories on how we can know something. The first type is called Methodism. And I don't mean here the denomination by John Wesley. <laughs> I'm referring here to this idea that we need a criteria, we need a method for how we can know something, okay? And then, once we have that criteria, then we can come to a basis of knowledge. So that's Methodism. Now, this is contrasted with what's called Particularism. It's the idea that we start as knowers, that we have knowledge about some things, of course, not all things, but at least some things we have knowledge about. And we don't need to know how we know them. So we, we know things, but we don't know how we know them. Right? So basically, we know that something is, but we don't know how it is. I know that my car will take me afterward here from the Defenders Media offices to KFC Taco Bell so we can have our... Uh, religious lunch. <laughs> By religious, I mean because we do it week after week. Uh, <laughs> I know that my car will take me there. I don't know how my car will take me there. Okay? I don't know how, you know, an engine works. I don't have that expansive knowledge. But I know that it works, right, until it stops. And then so I know something has gone wrong, and then I take it to the mechanic. Uh, all right. So, so that's uh, particularism. We know that we know something, but we don't know how we know it, okay? So one of the problems, so I, I consider myself what's called a particularist. I hold to, uh, there was a, a philosopher in the modern era called Thomas Reed. He advocated for what's called common sense realism. I uh, sympathetic to his view. Uh, and the concerns against Methodism is, remember, Methodism requires a criteria, in order that we can know something. All right. How do we know what that criteria is? How do we know what the criteria is? Unless we already know some things. Hence, particularism is true. 
that we at least know some things. We know that I exist or that this table is here or that we're in the Defenders Media offices. So we can know things, even if we don't know how we know them. Now, some people might say, uh, you might sort of get your, your scientismist here. Well, we just perceive things through the senses, the five senses. But of course, there are other things that we can know without the use of the senses. For example, that I am a thinking thing. I'm not using my physical senses. The fact that I know I am here and that I am the one thinking is something that scientism cannot prove. Uh, And yet I know it. So I'm a particularist. Blame me. All right. Let's get to the back to the mere possibility of error argument. Uh, If it's possible, how do you know you're not wrong? One of the uh, critical aspects to defeating this argument is to distinguish between a refutation and a rebuttal. A refutation is when you prove that someone is wrong. Okay? When you prove that someone's wrong. So, for example, if someone says Hillary Clinton is the President of the United States, I say, all right, come on, let's go to the White House. Let's go meet Donald J. Trump, he is the current president of the United States. That would be a refutation, right? You have proven someone wrong. A rebuttal to rebut someone simply means that they haven't shown you to be wrong. They haven't proven, they haven't successfully proven their case against you, okay? That's a fine distinction. A refutation is proving someone wrong, and a rebuttal is showing that someone hasn't proven you wrong. Now, when someone says, well, could you be wrong? The mere possibility of error. Could you be wrong right now? Sure. That in and of itself is not a refutation of my position. And as such, it provides no defeating ideas or what are called defeaters. It provides no defeaters for me to change my beliefs. Okay, I presently think that there are, no, not just think, I know there are no McDonald's on planet Mars. How do I know that? Could I be wrong? Of course I could be wrong. Even though I could be wrong, that doesn't mean I should begin doubting my knowledge that there are no restaurant McDonald's on planet Mars. It just doesn't provide a sufficient reason for me to think that. So, ultimately, this mere possibility of error argument uh, is, it's not a defeater, and the, the, within the realm of possibility is not the same as the realm of facts. Yeah, may I add um, that uh, we will have a guest speaker at our Deeper Roots conference coming up, and Jay Warner Wallace makes the distinction between reasonable and possibility. Yeah. Whereas anything is possible, a sinkhole can open up right below us here at the Defender's Media Office and suck us right in. <laughs> That's the possible yeah. nature of things. Is it reasonable to believe? Of course not. Therefore, we're sitting in these chairs having this interaction. And the skeptic, or the hyperskeptic, can continue on with this train of thought that anything is possible. However, we have to make the distinction, is it reasonable? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, so that leads me into, um, that's a a great segue. So um, oftentimes here, the particularist will assert some knowledge. And the mere possibility of error argument, when presented by the skeptic, um, will get into a, by using that argument, it'll get into a discussion about the burden of proof. All right. So, you know, the skeptic will say, well, you've got the burden of proof to to prove that X is true or that you know X. Okay. But the question about burden of truth needs to be uh, considered upon its reasonableness, as you pointed out, David. So, for example, when I asked you, what did you have for breakfast? And you said nothing. Well, Might you be wrong? Isn't it possible that you might be wrong? Yes, you might be wrong. 
But what reason do you have for thinking that you might be wrong? Right? None whatsoever. Yeah, right. You know that you had nothing for breakfast. And so in this case, uh, it when the skeptic wants to put the burden of proof upon the particularist, upon the person, or even suppose the, the Methodist, the, the person who they've already agreed upon some criteria, I, I wouldn't take that route at all. Um, but if, if the skeptic's going to do that, you just say, well, I don't think your, your uh, request for a burden of proof is reasonable. It's clearly more reasonable that, David, you know that you had nothing for breakfast. Correct. I mean, it just, it aligns with reality. Um, so, uh, and what I mean is the, the particularist view, I think, best fits with reality. Uh, so now let me talk more about that. There are two tasks in the realm of epistemology, epistemology being the study of how we know things. And those two tasks are as follows. First, we want to gain a maximum amount of true beliefs. Secondly, we want to limit the amount of false beliefs that we have. What do I mean by that? I don't, I don't mean, what I don't mean is that we believe something is false. What I mean is we think something is true, but in fact it is false. Okay? So the, t- the second task of epistemology is to limit those types of beliefs. Beliefs which we think are true but are, in fact, false. All right? So, that said, the skeptic cares more for having no false beliefs. The skeptic goes way on the end and says, well, because I don't want to have beliefs which are, in fact, false, I'm going to doubt everything. The skeptic cares more for having no false beliefs. The particularist cares more for seeking truth. The particularist wants to gain a maximal amount of true beliefs. So I think the skeptic goes too far on the second task of epistemology. And so I think that's interesting when some of us care more for seeking truth instead of just preventing us from having a false belief. Uh, I mean, ultimately, what's more important? I think I think having more true beliefs is more important than having a chunk of beliefs which are in fact false. Uh, okay, so skepticism, uh, as I've mentioned before, in a number of these cases where we've we've surveyed, it stems from things we already know. Skepticism depends upon already knowing things that I exist. I am a thinking thing that I can touch and feel things, uh, that, uh, that we know we were wrong. Skepticism already depends on knowledge. So obviously, we can know some things, all right? Now, if we can know some things, then from that basis, we can go on to the more difficult problems in life, having a criteria set, say, for how we can know historical facts, right? How we do historiography, um, and uh, and then and then coming to a consensus or a belief about historical events, so some of those more difficult things might flow from the criteria, but it's not methodism which starts with the criteria, right? Methodism depends upon the criteria to begin with, but the particularist already has beliefs; uh, they already know things. Sorry, they don't just have beliefs. The particularist already knows things to be true, even if they don't know how they're true. From that builds a criteria for discovering. Uh, and coming to know other things. So I think ultimately particularism fits with reality better than any of those camps. Um, And uh, ultimately, if skepticism were true, then we can know very few things or even nothing at all. And in our attempt to strive for truth here on the show, uh, we obviously would not affirm skepticism. And now that doesn't mean we're not open to being wrong and evaluating our beliefs. Of course, I think some of that's the purpose of the show to get us thinking about topics we might not have considered before, but that we are still seeking truth and that we're trying to do that in a constructive way. Uh, So I think ultimately particularism does fit better with reality because we do know things and we function as such. We function like we know things. So either it's just a big illusion, and if it's illusory, 
then we should just stop doing those things. Why is Rosenberg writing a book where he says sentences don't have meaning? It's pointless. He's wasting his time because it's all just pointless. It's all meaningless. So uh, I, those are those are my prepared thoughts on skepticism, David. I know maybe you had a couple other things. You had a quote from Rosenberg, right? From no, I just a uh, couple other thoughts. Sure. Uh, the foundation, especially, oh, I want to say the word here, presuppositionalist, yeah. apologist, is that uh, the foundation of our rationality, how we know things, is couched in the imago dei, the image of God. And the question for the skeptic has always been difficult, especially from the evolutionary point of view, where how can I get the rational from the irrational is a question that they have to battle with because a monkey cannot produce Shakespearean literature <laughs> and uh, that's not possible for them no matter how many monkeys you give me and no matter how much time you do. Yeah. The scriptures that I would like to cite sure, as sure. we close this program. And we might, you know, I'm not sure which passages you're going to bring here. We might have some slight disagreement, so we'll see. <laughs> and, I, you know, I say that the that the natural man, of course, is always in, re- is, is in rebellion towards God. So what he does, uh, Romans one eighteen. <laughs> He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. It doesn't matter how much evidence you give him, mm-hmm. uh, especially for these hard atheists, these uh, hard skeptics. Yeah. They will continue to suppress it, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, because their minds are have been blinded by the adversary. And we can see this in the Old Testament. We see when the evidence is given, the parting of the Red Sea, the ten plagues, the manna from heaven, the water coming out of the rock, and still they reject Yahweh. Hmm. And in the New Testament, we see in the raising of um, Lazarus in John eleven forty five through 46, we have this amazing miracle. And yet, you have in verse 45, those that believed, and in verse 46, in contrast, those that even though they have the evidence in front of them. Right. There is no doubt. They reject the evidence, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. I certainly, um, I might parse it out slightly differently, but I think by and large we're in agreement that for for some people, uh, they just won't believe. Um, and uh, th- that's going to be the case, you know, regardless of one's apologetic methodology, I think we should recognize that there just won't be people that are, that believe that they're hard-hearted uh and it's ultimately a matter of the will my concern here is about those people that are going to be swayed by the skeptic uh hopefully not the iterative skeptic (laughs) um but it happens so uh in let me say here in uh 2013 there was an article here listening to young atheists lessons for a stronger Christianity. This is a link from uh, this is a, an article from the Atlantic. I'll put the link up at the website. Uh, an interesting study found that when participants were asked to cite key influences in their conversion to atheism, people, books, seminars, etc., the uh, they write we expected to hear frequent references to the names of the new atheists, right? So um, the late Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris. I might even think, well, when people convert, maybe they read David Hume or some philosophers, you know, that influenced their thinking. But I would understand, of course, the more popular level, popular level um, the pop atheist icons, if you will. But they continue on, we did not, not once. So they didn't hear any source for these new atheists. Uh, the authors write, instead, we heard vague references to videos they had watched on YouTube or website forums. You see, skepticism has found its way on the internet. It seeped into these uh, platforms, YouTube, uh, web forums, and I think people are uh, have not been prepared to to handle skepticism. And so, when they all of a sudden might see something where they begin doubting something, they don't know how to handle it, and they might go off the deep end. Some people might, you know, here's a great example. So Bart Ehrman. Uh, the the uh, critical scholar, New Testament scholar at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, former Christian, former devout evangelical, he went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He is no longer a Christian. His his path uh, 
started his path away from Christianity started as a result of his discovering supposed differences in the gospels. All right? Now, these supposed differences in the gospels shook his faith. And almost as a reaction, he began to doubt everything. Maybe maybe you know someone who's like that. And this does not seem to be a justified logical step. Even if there were differences in the Gospels, l- let me go further, even if there were contradictions in the Gospels, that doesn't mean Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Okay? So to go from differences or even contradictions in the Bible to completely rejecting the faith is an unwarranted leap. And... Um, I know people that have, like, Ehrman taking that step, and I don't think that there's good reason for doing so. Uh, it's, you know, in this sense, I think we just need to uh, rebut that argument that if there are contradictions in the Bible, therefore Christianity is false, we just need to, to have a rebuttal. I don't think we even need to refute. We just need to rebuttal and say, okay, well, that, you know, that doesn't follow. That step doesn't happen. Uh, so... Uh, you know, it's this, it's, this, it's this type of skepticism that I think, I, I'm, you know, we should try to help people recognize uh, that when they're watching this YouTube video or they're reading this website forum, they don't have to buy into it. Uh, and we need to think critically uh, about the, uh, the rhetoric, whether it's good rhetoric or bad rhetoric, that one might be reading about or listening to on a YouTube video. Recognize the ethos, the pathos, the logos. Recognize, okay, what's the ethos being presented here? What's the pathos being presented here? And especially as someone concerned with arguments and thinking, well, what's the logos being represented here? What's the argument? Does it follow? What does that mean? How far does it take me? We should ask these questions because honestly, you know, it probably doesn't take you as far as you might be tempted to go. And I think that's what it's about too. It's about temptation. I think skepticism, I I think it's really, I mean, I'll go so far, it's the work of the devil. I mean, when it, when it takes root in people's mm-hmm. lives where they just feel lost and alone, drowning in skepticism uh, because they have no foundation for knowledge. But I think we need to recognize how it is self-defeating, how it, how it depends. Not only is it self-defeating, but it depends upon knowledge that we have. And so I think as such, we should put it aside there should, of course, be a healthy sense of skepticism. But what I'm talking about here is this philosophical outlook, this methodology of skepticism. I don't think it's good at all. Uh, I think it's unhelpful. It's not constructive. Uh, and as a result, we should reject that type of skepticism. Well, with that, uh, I think that does it for the show today. Uh, I want to thank you for listening in and uh, for uh, considering along with me here these uh, these different types of skepticism, the three different types of skeptics. Uh, also, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Bobby Bonilla day. Uh, <laughs> $1.2 million <laughs> every July 1st. Hopefully you'll remember that for next year. Um, but before we sign off here, let me say next week, June 8th, it's our 52nd episode, which means we've been coming to you for a whole year. And so for the for next week's episode, we're doing an Ask Me Anything. So I want you to submit your questions. I've already got a couple of people that have submitted questions. Uh, you can email me, Kurt at VeracityHill.com, or you can leave us a message as well on our call line, 505-2STRIVE. That's 505-278-7483. All right. Well, I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons uh, and the partnerships that we have with our sponsors, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, Evolution 2.0, and Rocio Christie. Thank you to the tech team today, Chris, and to, to our guest. David, I'll give you credit here for being on the, the panel. Appreciate it. And I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.